Welcome. Thanks for joining me for our session two and remaining me. You've spent the last week poring over John 15, reading patiently and purposefully, making observations. This is the hardest step in study because we want to stay with the text and let it speak for itself rather than looking to other places to gain understanding. Honestly, I don't care how much you got done. I'm just thrilled that you tried. Stick with it. If you're frustrated, that's okay. We're learning new skills and frustration is part of that journey. It's worthy though, and I want to encourage you to continue on. Reach out to the friends that you're studying with so that they can encourage you. We're in this together. Be gentle with yourself. Even if we gain one new skill or get a little more confident, that's movement in the right direction, and that's worth celebrating. So we're closely studying John 15. It's one of 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. And in your homework, you will take a closer look at the context in the chapters surrounding John 15. That will help us understand where our particular chapter fits within the book itself. But today, we're going to look together at the book of John itself, the author, why it was written, and how it fits into the Bible, and how it's structured. So first, let's begin in prayer. God, we thank you so much that we can continue to meet and gather and study your word. We thank you that you are a sovereign God, that you are in control of all of our circumstances, that you knew this was going to happen before it did, and that you are with us. Lord, that you have sent your Holy Spirit to comfort and guide us. I ask that you would speak your words through me today, Lord, that you would be glorified and lifted up that we would fall in love with Jesus and what he's done for us again, Lord, and that we would be different because we've been together and in your word. We thank you. You're a good and glorious God. Amen. Okay, so last week we covered a lot of material, and I just wanted to review those four main big ideas that we use to come to a text and remind us how to approach scripture. The first is that the Bible is all about God, and that causes us to ask questions like, who, do I, who is he? What do I see of him? What do I learn of him here in this passage? Next, we look at biblical theology. Who is the author? Why are they writing? What is their context? What assumptions do they make? What beliefs do they have? The third is that we read the Bible as a whole. Hendricks in Living by the Book said that it is not a collection of parts, it is an integrated whole. And this causes us to ask questions like, how does what w is written here fit with the rest of scripture? Where is the continuity that I see in the story? And finally, Christ is central. From beginning to end, God is writing a redemptive story to draw us to him. That causes us to come to a piece of text and ask ourselves, what do I see of God? What do I see of salvation? Is there a new image here? How does this reveal my need for Christ? So all of these ask us, prompt us to ask certain questions. And with these things in mind, we come to, the, to a book in the Bible and ask, who is the author? Why has he written? Who is he writing to and what circumstances prompted the writing? And how does this book fit with the rest of God's story? These big questions help us ask good questions. And so with those ideas in mind, let's look at the Gospel of John. There are four Gospels that open up the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus' Jesus's ministry occurred between 27 and 30 AD. The Gospel of Mark was thought to be written in 60 AD. Matthew and Luke follow closely after between 60 and 70 AD. And then John is the last written, between 90 and 100 AD. So all of the Gospels were wit written within 30 to 60 years of Jesus' ministry. Why is their date of writing important? The closer to an event that a record is written, the more accurate is it is. The Gospels are recorded close enough to the life of Christ that when they are written, th uh, there are eyewitnesses who are still there to, to account for and confirm their accuracy. The first three Gospels contain many of the same accounts, and they are called the Synoptic Gospels because we can almost lay them out and compare their accounts. Each Gospel is unique because each writer is unique. They have their own reasons for writing and their own audience that they're addressing, and while still inspired by the Holy Spirit, their uni unique personalities come through. J 
John is a fascinating gospel. It is unique among the four, as are the others, but upwards of 90% of its content is different from the material recorded in the other three. It's the last to be written, and it's not actually arranged as a narrative in order, but it's rather arranged in a manner so as to communicate who Jesus is. The reason we send new believers to the book of John is because it's a portrait of Christ. In the Greek New Testament, the noun for gospel means good news, and it occurs 76 times. The Greek verb for gospel means to bring about good news, to announce good news, and it's recorded 54 times. Both words are derived from the Greek noun angelo, which means messenger. The Gospels are just that. They are messages brought to announce the good news of Jesus. So when we're reading any of these books, we're already asking ourselves, what, does, do, what do they reveal to me of God and of Jesus and salvation? What is the good news? The Gospel of John is the good news written by John. He was a fisherman with his older brother James and their father Zebedee, and he conducted his living on the Sea of Galilee. He was called by Jesus to follow, and he was among 12 that spent Jesus' ministry together with him. He was also among a smaller group of three that accompanied Jesus to more intimate events. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus at the healing of Jairus' daughter, on the mountain for the transfiguration, and on the eve of his arrest, it is these three that follow him further into Gethsemane where he goes to pray. James and John are blue-collar workers. They're fishermen. They have a special nickname. Jesus calls them sons of thunder. There is no explanation for this, and it makes us wonder, what does the text tell us that could dis- let us understand the name and the nickname? James and John are a little extreme. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples are traveling through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. When Jesus looks for accommodations for the evening, he's met with resistance and opposition because there is prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Sons of Thunder is sounding a little bit more you know, it makes sense. (laughs) They're pretty extreme. They're a little thunderous. James and John are also ambitious. There are a couple of recordings of them requesting to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus in heaven. One is found in Mark 10 and the other in Matthew 20. This indicates that they are ambitious. They want those coveted positions of power to the right and left of Jesus. These accounts cause a little bit of a stir amongst the disciples and create a bit of a fight. Now the nickname is making even a little more sense. In his gospel, John refers to himself five times as the one whom Jesus loved. If you've listened to some other preachers, they give John a bit of a hard time for this. They tease him because it seems self-promoting or assuming or prideful. Craig has often wondered out loud if this was just a running joke between the disciples. And the more I think about it, the more I kind of wonder as well. We'll never know, but just indulge me a little. I don't know a group of friends who has a lot of history together that don't have inside jokes. As I was reading through Matthew earlier this year, I noticed in his narrative of Peter, James, and John going with Jesus to the mountain for the transfiguration, that Matthew makes a point of saying John, the brother of James, which is really kind of funny because this is already written when the early church is established and John is a well-known prominent leader. It seems likely to me that the disciples fought about who would be the greatest until it actually became a joke. I prefer to think they're teasing each other, but honestly, we'll never know. It's all conjecture. Regardless of what our thoughts are on this, John is the one that Jesus entrusts with his mother's care after he leaves. Clearly, John was close to Jesus. John is a first-hand eyewitness to the life of Christ. He has personal experience, as well as years of having Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his home with him. All of this gives him credibility as the author of this gospel and the events he records. There is some debate over who John wrote his gospel to. He lived and ministered in Ephesus, and so it does make sense that that would be who he would write to. However, there's disagreement, so the one thing we can agree on is that he does write to believers. 
In Matthew 16, 15, Jesus asks a really important question. Who do you say that I am? And on that occasion, under divine revelation, Peter answers him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the most critical question of our existence. Our answer determines what we do with the good news of Jesus. Our answer determines our eternity. And this is the exact question that John addresses through his whole gospel. Who do you say that I am? John writes this gospel to create a perfect picture of who Jesus is. John doesn't even want us to miss the point because he writes his purpose clearly for us in, John, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe. Literally, in the Greek, it says that you may continue to believe. So these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The phrase continue to believe is what indicates that this gospel is written to believers. There are two main sections to John's gospel. He uses the significant biblical number seven to create this structure and highlight the completeness and perfection of Jesus. The use of the number seven in this way starts at the creation account and continues throughout scripture. The first section of John's gospel focuses on seven specific signs and the first few of the I am statements. These are used to demonstrate that Jesus is the son of God and to prove and to prove his divine identity. In the recordings of the signs, John's main focus on, is on how the people there respond to Jesus. The second part of John focuses on Jesus giving his life to save us, his resurrection, appearing to his followers, and then the reinstatement of Peter. We do not actually discover the specific circumstances for John writing. And as mentioned before, he does not he does tell us his purpose, and that is to encourage believers to keep believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that in his name we have life. The key verse to John is exactly the one we might expect. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John is very clear about his purpose. His defense, his writing is a defense of Jesus as the Son of God and as Jesus as God. As he opens his books, he writes, oh, as he opens his book, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that light of, sorry, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It is a statement that seems so simple, but when we look closely, it reveals some of the deepest mysteries of God. What might you recognize right off the bat? We read, in the beginning, and that phrase immediately reminds us of the opening of Genesis. John intends for his readers to draw this parallel, that his words are the same as the ones that open Genesis. At these words in the beginning, the original audience would have perked up. They would have been comparing what John was about to say to what was written in Genesis, and we need to do the same. John chose these words specifically, and they're meant to catch our attention. They're purposeful. Our fall study reminded us that the creation account was written by Moses as he's sending the children of God off into a new land without him. Moses is preparing God's people to live in a land that would challenge their faith, their identity, and their practices. The Genesis account is about God, and it leads to the beginning of his relationship with people. It is commonly thought that John is grabbing his readers' attention and alerting them to a new beginning. This new beginning is through Jesus and who Jesus is. It is the new beginning of how God wants to relate to his people. He wants to relate to them through his son. 
And John is writing so those who believe, and he's trying to encourage them to remember the truth of who Jesus is and the life that they have in him. In the beginning was the word, and the Greek word there is logos. In the Holman New Testament commentary, it says that the Jews actually often referred to God with such terminology as the word. The use of this phrase supports that the doctrine at stake is Jesus' deity. Jesus is God, and John wanted to make sure immediately that we know this. In fact, his prologue begins and ends with firm statements supporting this. The closing verse, verse 18, says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who himself is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. John states three bold facts, three big assumptions. First, he assumes without room for question that there is God. He states clearly that Jesus is the Son of God and God's only Son. And without question, Jesus is God. With repetition in this opening passage and throughout his gospel, John is clearly making a point. And he uses the seven signs and the seven I am statements to prove this point. Referring to God as the word was not a new concept to the Jewish believers, but it was not a new concept to the Greek believers either. Logos was a word and a concept developed 300 years earlier by Aristotle, and it was a prevalent in their philosophy. So in this one statement, John grabs both the Jewish and Greek believers' attention and, and makes them pay attention. Some of the other Gospels start with the earthly birth of Jesus. Uh, John begins in eternity, identifying Jesus as God and creator, and that in him all things were made. Another important truth that John repeats through his Gospel is first stated in chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just as God walked uh, intimately with Adam and Eve before the fall, Jesus came and walked with man. He lived with people. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus, in living among us, revealed who God is. This is familiar but different. It was not God the Father who came in the garden this time. This was his son. John wants his readers to believe specifically that Jesus is the Christ, the Jewish Messiah, who is prophesied of in the Old Testament. He wants his readers to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, sent by God, which means he is God in human flesh. The height of faith in John's gospel builds to the moment where Thomas sees the risen Lord and proclaims, my Lord and my God. And Jesus responds in the next verse by saying, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In writing this gospel, John is painting his portrait. These seven signs and seven I am statements are used to accomplish the perfection of this portrait. He purposefully calls the miracle signs because they reveal who Jesus is and they confirm that Jesus is who he claims to be, the Son of God. Out of so many miracles, we have to wonder what these specific seven show. Why did he use these signs to build his portrait? The miracles that John records are Jesus turning water into wine, found in John chapter 2, healing the nobleman's son in John 4, healing the lame man by the pool of Bethsaida, feeding the 5,000 and walking on water, both found in John chapter 6, healing the man born blind, found in John chapter 9, and raising Lazarus from the dead, found in John 11. The first sign is Jesus turning water into wine. We may miss some of the imagery because we're unfamiliar with Jewish culture. There was so much ceremonial cleaning that required water at a wedding that they had jugs and jugs and jugs ready to fill and filled for this purpose. It is these ceremonial cleansing jugs that Jesus tells the servants to go fill. Jesus has just responded to his mother by saying that his hour has not yet come 
And with this statement, Jesus and John put the cross at the center of Jesus' ministry. And John moves us along the following 19 chapters at a relentless pace toward that hour. It's interesting that the servants are the first to witness Jesus' sign. They go and fill the jugs and discover that it's turned to this wine. They bring a sample to the master of the feast, and he has no idea where it has come from or that it's been transformed. But John makes a point of saying that the servants knew. This sign, turning ceremonial cleansing water into wine, is the start of Jesus' public ministry. And John makes a point of saying that in seeing this sign, the disciples believed in him. The second sign is when Jesus heals the nobleman's son in John chapter 4. This happens close to the Sea of Galilee, and this is where a majority of Jesus' ministry occurs. Matthew eleven twenty to 24 tells us that this is also the area where Jesus is most rejected. When the man comes to ask Jesus to heal his son, Jesus responds, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. The use of you people suggests that Jesus is speaking more than just the nobleman, to the crowd or to the area, because they just are, they're refusing to believe. The nobleman is undeterred, and he asks again for Jesus to come and see his child, that Jesus might heal him. Jesus says to him, go, your child will be healed. The man believes and immediately heads home. He is met by his servants who tell him that his child is well, and the man puts it together that at the moment that Jesus spoke is when his child has been healed. Faith in the word manifested healing, and then because of healing, the entire man's household came to belief in Jesus. Jesus did not need to be present to heal the child. His word alone is enough to accomplish it. And this is evidence he is Jesus, the Son of God. He has power and authority. When healing the lame man, Jesus is back in Jerusalem. People would lay at the pool, and when it was supernaturally stirred, the first one in would be healed. Jesus asks a man if he wants to be healed, to which he responds, I have no one to help me into the pool. Jesus commands him to pick up his mat and walk, and the man is immediately challenged by angry Pharisees. It is thought that carrying his mat was to break the Sabbath rest. In the face of opposition, the lame man immediately tries to point Jesus out in the crowd. Later, Jesus finds him and says, stop sinning. The man immediately goes to tell the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. In this sign, there is no expression of faith from the man who is healed but we see an animosity starting to build within the religious leaders towards Jesus. Jesus has done this miracle on the Sabbath, and by doing so, he is demonstrating his authority and that he is Lord of the Sabbath. As a result of this sign, a large group reject Jesus and begin to persecute him. Jesus uses this opportunity to tell those around him, my father is working until now, and I am working. To call himself the son of God, by calling God his Father, is to claim deity. And those who did not believe in him considered it blasphemy. At this point, a group starts to plot Jesus' death. Jesus tells us himself why three of these signs are important, because he links them to I am statements. For the sign of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus and his disciples are back in the area of Galilee again. A crowd has gathered, and Jesus turns to his disciple Philip and asks him, Where can we buy food for all of these people to eat? John says that Jesus has asked this to test Philip, for Jesus already knew what he had in mind. Philip answers Jesus saying, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Then with five small barley loaves and two small fish, Jesus gives thanks to the Father and distributes the loaves and the fish. Twelve baskets full of pieces are left over. Enough for one for each disciple. This response to Jesus here is that people recognize his power and want to position him to their own benefit. 
They see how they can meet their expectations and needs rather than recognizing that he is the Son of God and that they are in need of him for salvation. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew into the mountain by himself. Right after this is John's very condensed version of Jesus walking on the water. Only the disciples are present. There is no explanation about, about it or any description about the disciples' response. We can only observe a few things. They have gone ahead of Jesus to the other side of the sea. A terrible storm is developing. And then the disciples see a man walking on the water. They're fearful, but once they know it is Jesus, they're willing to take him into the boat. And once they, he is in the boat, they find themselves safely at the other side. They encounter a crowd upon arriving, and Jesus states in that dialogue that I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will not thirst. It is the first of the I am state statements. After this, Jesus begins to face even more opposition. It is thought that these two signs are done in the presence of the disciples to build their faith and fortify them for what is coming. The Son of God, Jesus, has made himself known. He's not just there to meet physical needs. It's his desire that people come to him and receive eternal sustenance. The next sign is the healing of the blind man. This sign is done on the Sabbath also, which enrages the Pharisees again. Jesus is accused of breaking laws. However, he's only breaking their additional laws, their extra laws about Sabbath. Before Jesus gives sight to the blind man, he states, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The blind man, after receiving healing, is interviewed by the Pharisees. They're angry. He says he doesn't know who healed him or where the man is. The Pharisees makes, make all kinds of derogatory statements about Jesus, and yet the healed man defends him. When the Pharisees are unsatisfied, they start questioning him all over again. Frustrated, almost, it seems from his words, the healed man now states, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. After this accurate and powerful defense of Jesus, the man is expelled from the temple. And the account continues. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? asks the man. Tell me that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man says, Lord, I believe, and begins to worship. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who will see, and those who see will become blind. John uses his sign to demonstrate who Jesus is in hopes that we will respond in the same way the healed man does, that we will recognize that Jesus is the light of the world, and we will respond in worship. The final sign is the raising of Lazarus. Martha comes out to meet Jesus, hearing that he is coming. She comes and meets him and says, Lazarus has died, but Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answers. I believe that you were the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. When Mary comes to meet Jesus, she also says, Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus would not have died. Seeing their grief, Jesus weeps with them. It shows the depth of his heart and compassion for humanity and for his friends. Then he asks for the grave to be opened. The account says, Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. Jesus acknowledged his father so that once the sign was performed, the people who witnessed it would believe that he was sent from God and was indeed God's son. Many did respond in faith. However, some decide to stir up trouble. They tattle to the Pharisees, whose rejection of Jesus and determination to kill him is strengthened. The Old Testament contains many prophecies of what the Messiah would do. It says he will make the lame walk and the blind see. Many saw these wonders and rejected Jesus. This is why the faith of those who believe without seeing is commended. When Jesus appeared and performed these very signs, the world's response was divided. Some believed and some rejected him. Some came to saving faith. Others wanted to use Jesus to their own advantage and still others wanted to kill him for meddling in a system that was comfortable and profitable. I feel like the blind man said it best. To those who doubted, he said, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Jesus himself tells us in John 15 that he did works that no one else had done and yet was rejected. The signs that John used reveal the glory of God. They reveal the glory of his son. They paint a picture of his divine identity, authority, and his power. Now we're going to look at the I am statements a little more closely. Again, John uses these to, to build his argument that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus uses his name, I am, especially in uh, chapter 8, to solidify his identity as the Son of God. I am is the name God himself called himself in the Old Testament. It is the name he gave to Moses to tell the Israelites who had sent him to deliver them out of Egypt. In John, Jesus uses this very name. He's conversing with a group of Jews about who he is, and they want to disregard him. They want to consider him a prophet or less than that. He replies to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. At this point, the Jews pick up stones to throw at him. Jesus manages to disappear into the crowd. Why do they pick up stones? His words were blasphemy to them. They didn't believe he was the Son of God, and so to call himself, I am, was to claim deity, which was blasphemy. It was a sin worthy of death by stoning. I am is how God identified himself, and in using that name, Jesus boldly claims he is God, with no apology. I am was a sacred phrase to the Jewish believers and listeners and readers. Any statement containing that phrase would have been significant to them. The seven I am statements that John uses and records here are, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8, I am the door of the sheep, and I am the shepherd, both found in John chapter 10. I am the resurrection and the life in John 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. And finally, the one that we're studying, I am the true vine in John 15. After feeding the 5,000 and walking on the water, Jesus is discovered by the crowd, and they're surprised to see him on the opposite side of the lake. Jesus says to them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're not coming to me because you see the wonder of what I am and do. You're coming to me because you got something from me. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. The crowd has become addicted to to Jesus' power, and they ask him for another sign. Jesus replies, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. And this is found in John 6, 35. 
As I mentioned earlier, the opposition is growing towards Jesus at this point. He's starting to lose his popularity. He is telling the crowd that he isn't there to meet their earthly needs, to give them what they want. He is there for something much greater, for eternal sustenance. To receive this life, they have to believe that God has sent him and that he is God. If mankind cannot accept Jesus as from God and is God, they will not receive this eternal life, the sustenance he alone can give. As the bread of life, Jesus alone offers true spiritual life. Before the healing of the blind man, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. He who believes in me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As we look back on John chapter 1, I believe John himself tells us why this statement is significant. In John chapter 1, verses 5 and 9, he writes, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was come into the world. And in John 15, 22, Jesus says, I am not come and spoken to them. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Jesus was a light who shone in the darkness. What was wrong was revealed by his light and his perfection. He exposes and reveals. As the light of the world, whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He reveals our need. In John 10, 7, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. In some translations, it reads, I am the gate. But notice there is only one. It's an exclusive statement. There was only one door into the evening enclosure that the shepherds would herd their sheep into that had high walls and the one gate to ensure they'd be safe at night. In saying he is the door, Jesus is saying that he is the only point of entry towards God. It is only through him that we gain access. It's an exclusive claim that many struggle with. But Jesus is the only one who died and conquered death, and he alone is the one able to lead us to God. The next I am statement occurs in John 10, where he says, I am the good shepherd. A few years ago, Craig and I attended a conference where shepherding was the topic, that Jesus, the good shepherd, was the focus. We learned a lot about shepherding, and it was very interesting to watch by video a herd respond to the call of their shepherd. Jesus protects his followers as a shepherd protects their flock. Here's what happened every day. In the morning, the flocks would see their shepherds come through the gate. They would begin calling out to their sheep, and the sheep would recognize their shepherd's call. They would go out and follow him. Once the flocks were separated, the shepherd would lead his flock to pasture. We learn in Psalm 23 that the shepherd led his sheep to food, to quiet water for them to drink, to safe places to rest. In the care of their shepherd, they lack nothing. The shepherd had unique calls for each individual sheep, so he could call it out of the herd to examine it, to make sure that it wasn't caught with brambles, to see that it was uninjured, and to make sure that it was well. We know that David, as a shepherd, protected his herds from bear and lion. When Jesus says that he is the good shepherd, he is saying he is the one who will provide, protect, care for, and lead us. In him, we lack nothing. Finally, in John chapter 11, we get to the account of Lazarus' this passing. Upon hearing the news that Lazarus is seriously ill, Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. This is so confusing to us. And when Mary hears that he's coming, we already mentioned that she'd gone out to meet him, where he says to her this fascinating statement, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, shall, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? In this statement, Jesus claims to be the one who gives life, who holds the power over death and life. He who believes, though he dies, will live, and those who live will never die. Only God has this power over life. In their worldview, it was God who had that authority. Jesus not only heals, he brings those who are dead to life through only his word. God's word brought to life 
into, in the beginning of Genesis. And now Jesus, with words, brings to life. When humanity chose sin, death entered and separated us from God. Now, through belief in Jesus, the word, eternal life is ours. In John 14, Jesus says a loaded statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, this is an extremely exclusive statement, and he claims three significant roles in it. In saying he is the way, Jesus makes another exclusive statement that only through him can we have access. Jesus came from God, and he is the one who brings us back to God. In the Jewish faith, the only way for the people to come to God was through the high priest. The high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And when Jesus say, says he is the way, he is saying he is our high priest. Through his sacrifice, we can come into God's very presence without fear of being consumed. Jesus made atonement for us, and he is the way to God. How is he the way? He is the way by being the truth and the life. He reveals our need by exposing who God is and who we are in relation to God. Truth and life correspond to Jesus' roles in the gospel as revealer and life giver. Our rebellion separated us from God, and because of it, we fell into ignorance and death. It follows that the way to the Father requires both revelation to cure us of our ignorance and life to heal us of death. The way to the Father is through Jesus. He is the truth and the life. He came to show us the Father, and in seeing his perfection, our imperfection was exposed. John explains in, that Jesus is the life in John 1, 2, and 4. He was in the beginning was with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. That was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He came and died and conquered death, rising victorious to the right hand of the Father. And because of that, he can offer us life. Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. The final I am statement is I am the true vine, which we're studying in John 15. I'm actually going to save its significance for next week because I don't want to get ahead of you. So keep doing your homework, and we'll come back together next week to talk more about that. This last I am statement is followed by more teaching about the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus is tried, or tries to prepare the, the disciples for the grief that they will experience as he leaves them, encouraging them that their sorrow will once again turn to joy. In John 17 is a beautiful prayer which reveals the heart of Jesus for his disciples, disciples and followers, including those who will believe through their message. He prays for us. He prays for the unity of his followers and that they would be made holy. Jesus is then arrested and put on trial. Peter denies his Lord three times. Jesus is sentenced and crucified. And then the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. John records Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, to Thomas, to the disciples, and then after that is when John states so clearly his purpose in 20 verses 30 and 31. John's gospel closes with Jesus meeting the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Peter, Nathaniel, James, John, and two others are together. Peter says he's going out to fish and the others go with him. They catch nothing. A man tells Peter to go and try again, but throw the net on the other side. They don't know it's Jesus. They do what they're asked, and they come with this massive load of fish that they can't even haul in. At this point, they recognize it's Jesus. Jesus has a fire going. He asks Peter to bring some of the fish, and even with so many fish, the net isn't ripped. That's an important fact to a fisherman. Jesus so beautifully restores and commissions Peter to feed his sheep, and he renews the call to follow me. John closes his gospel by saying, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, 
I suppose even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. The Old Testament finishes wanting. The nation of Israel has been divided. Both kingdoms have been incredibly faithless, faithless and rebellious. After many warnings and pleas from the Lord through his prophets, asking his people to return to him, he has to discipline, in the face, discipline them in the face of their continued rebellion. The northern kingdom is, distra- distra- is destroyed by Assyria. Captives of those ten tribes are exiled back to Assyria, and it is thought that they have all disappeared, but there is no concrete evidence of that. The southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin is conquered by Babylon, and exiles are taken back to Babylon. Daniel is among those, as, long as, as well as Ezra and Nehemiah. In the, as the last pages of the Old Testament close, a remnant from Judah and Benjamin has been allowed to resettle in their homeland. They have returned, but they're not a sovereign state. They are under Medo-Persian rule. The king of David's line, Zerubbabel, is not on his throne. And they're a puppet nation. Then after 400 years of silence, we open up the pages of the New Testament. We learn that Israel is still not sovereign. They are under Roman rule. And we see that there still is no king from the line of David on the throne. But one from the line of David has appeared. The first four books of the New Testament are dedicated to this man who is from the line of David. He is from God and he is God. His name is Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give a narrative of Jesus while John paints this portrait to answer the biggest question they and all who have come after have ever had to wrestle with. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And John replies with conviction throughout his book so that his, the followers will continue to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. Thanks for being with me today. Lord, we come before you in this Easter week blown away by the cost of our sin and your willingness to pay it. Lord, we thank you that you've gone to such great lengths to save us that we might have a relationship with you. We thank you for your perfect lamb, Jesus, who is atonement for us and through rising in the cross gives us victory. May we have great joy as we celebrate all that you've done for us and a renewed love for you because of the lengths that you've gone that we might know you and love you. Believe in the Son of Jesus and have life in his name. Amen.